we ended five minutes late, and uh, you've kept us five minutes late, which means we're on time, I guess, in a, in a peculiar world. Um, I feel a bit, uh, a, a bit uh, in danger up here, having having a Swiss on the on the uh, panel. So I'll, I'll try and keep this uh, strictly to time, and it won't be hard because drinks are at the end. So we will end it in an hour and ten minutes. Now, the format uh, for the second part of the day, as you know, is a panel. Um, and this panel, what I'm going to do is ask uh, each of the three, um, really in the order of, uh, if I could, uh, Mark, uh, then Jakob, and then Stuart, uh, to make some comments, uh, really only three or four minutes, so that we can keep about 45 minutes to time. And then, um, because of the nature of, of the symposium, uh, around a quarter past or so, I'd like to turn uh, to Nicholas and Richard for any comments they might like to make on, on this panel session as well. Uh, so that'll be the format for now. Again, the biographies are in your, uh, in your agenda, so I shan't read it out. Uh, and we will have, I think, hopefully a lot of time for participation. So with no further ado, uh, Mark, would you like to kick us off, please? Michael or uh, Alderman uh, Mainelli, as I should say, um, being here just inside the, the square miles uh, borders. Listen, it's, I'm delighted to be here today. Um, take part in what is actually a very important debate for the UK economy as a whole. And I believe that understanding the relationship between the City of London, which as you imagine is uh, very close to my own heart, uh, and indeed the rest of the UK, with the international financial market, um, has rightly been a major political uh, preoccupation with all of the caveats that we've heard about earlier on today since the financial crisis of the autumn of 2008. Now, as the local member of parliament, I have perhaps the strongest um, constituency link to offshore finance. Uh, London, as the world's largest financial centre, has strong relationships across a global network of financial centres. Now, often uh, it strikes me that this relationship is deliberately misrepresented uh, in the popular media, not just by uh, um, more high-brow people such as Nicholas Shaxton earlier on, but also by many in the NGO community. As a result, the UK debate on offshore finance is typically seen through this prism of tax avoidance and tax evasion, and those two terms are also rather too interchangeable for my liking. The very term tax haven suggests that tax, or rather the avoidance of tax, is the sole purpose for which those offshore centres exist, and I think that uh, Richard Hay made some very important points about this whole sense uh, of the city extending to um, what I often call the fee pool beyond financial services, but also the reliability um, of the rule of law being such an important uh, part of uh, its attraction. There are those who abuse the tax rules in offshore centres. Um, however, there has also been a wide-ranging debate on the link between offshore <coughs> finance and taxation and an even wider array of incentives and initiatives, rather, to address the concern about tax leakages from the UK. Um, as many of you know, the UK's leadership of the G8 in 2013 demonstrates our government's commitment to improving tax transparency and reducing the abuse of the tax system. And I think it's also worth noting that the UK's Crown dependencies and overseas territories have fully signed up to that process, and indeed many uh, were signed up well in advance of that process beginning. Um, what I think has been less commonly debated, however, is the fundamental benefits which arise from maintaining the current network of well-regulated offshore financial centres. Um, Capital Economics has talked much about um, the tremendous contribution that is made by the offshore, by, by, by the uh, Crown dependencies, in particular Jersey, applies to the Isle of Man, which I've had uh, links with, not least I've been out uh, uh, with the Isle of Man government to China only uh, in the last couple of weeks uh, on a trade mission. But uh, tremendous contribution made to the UK balance of payments, um, combination of trade and investment that helps to support over 180,000 jobs um, in the UK, and crucially, the Capital Economics report found that Jersey itself helps to generate UK taxes uh, worth over two and a half billion pounds annually with uh, the liquidity assistance. That's just one offshore centre. The UK government's own review concluded that the UK has consistently been the net recipient of funds that have flown through the banking system uh, through our Crown dependencies and offshore financial centres. I think to help understand the true benefits of offshore finance, one has to understand the important role of financial intermediation and its importance in the global capital markets. Put simply, in a global economy, money increasingly will want to move across borders. Offshore financial centres greatly assist in that process 
and the UK has, of course, been the single biggest beneficiary of that change. As a nation, our domestic stock of long-term savings has often fallen short of our investment needs. As a result, we rely and will continue to rely heavily upon inward investment and have been hugely successful in attracting such capital. And that, of course, is where the financial mediation, um, intermediation plays such an important role. Much of the UK's financial investment capital is channeled through offshore centres, uh, which are often the easiest ways to pool capital, as was explained earlier on. The UK's offshore centres, I think, help to make the UK a uniquely attractive place to invest and do business. Um, I have much more to say. Uh, I know that I'm coming up to the end, end of my time and Michael will tick me off, but I'm obviously very happy to take uh, questions along with the panel going forward. Let me just finish, if I may, on this point. I think the current debate in the UK fails to reflect the reality because we often ignore the very substantial benefits of offshore finance and focus purely on the potential downside risks. And I hope that today's seminar um, has given us an, an opportunity to air uh, both the pros and the cons of this in greater detail and will, will therefore ensure that all of you will play, have a chance to play your part in a more balanced public debate. Thank you very much, Mark. And I'm delighted to see a politician stick to time. Well done. Uh, Jakob. Thank you. Um, I think that uh, offshore centers or financial centers that, that, uh, do, uh, that, that offer financial services across the borders are really a big benefit of the, of, of the global economy. For me, this is, this is just a matter of, of uh, division of labor. You do that what you know uh, how to do best. And that's what uh, Switzerland does and the Swiss financial uh, center does. We do offer financial services uh, and we stick to our core values, stability, universality, and everything out of one hand, responsibility, and excellence. And we need to be careful that we're not uh, fighting battles that, that are over. Since 2009, uh, the Swiss Financial Center and the Swiss Bank in Switzerland, actually, and, and uh, the Swiss banks uh, are following a strategy of tax compliance. First, it was um, it was a method method uh, that was uh, keeping more uh, privacy um, withholding tax uh, method, and uh, and now, of course. The world has changed, and we are moving towards a global standard of uh, information exchange. Switzerland is part of that, and we, the banking sector, are in favor of that, provided is, it is a, a, a global uh, a, a level playing field. Now, we had a discussion before that, of course, that the most important financial center is, uh, is using different standards. And I think a lot of money is actually going to move there. A lot of money that should be taxed uh, and is not taxed will will move there from many places uh, on, on the earth. So I think we should not, we should, we should not battle with uh, imaginary uh, enemies. I think if you want to have your financial services uh, provided from, from a place that is stable and also um, predictable, then I think that's a good thing, especially now. And I think Switzerland and Swiss banks are really, are really almost the de definition of that. In Switzerland, things move very slowly, sometimes unnervingly slowly. If you, you're going to see a political change 20 years uh, before, uh, before it really happens. And in, this, in the crisis, actually, the Swiss financial center has held up much better than other financial centers. There has never been a credit, a credit problem in Switzerland, for example. And I believe that's probably also true for the other uh, financial centers that we were speaking today. So, what are we talking about? Um, if we are attacking a tax evasion, of course tax evasion is not a good thing, but it is not the root of all evil. If countries have uh, entered uh, into unsustainable uh, fiscal policy, this is not primarily because not all taxes can be collected. It may play a role, but why the, the crisis wasn't caused by tax evasion. There were other things that were going on, and the debt crisis that we have now probably has very little to do with tax evasion, uh, evasion uh, and much more with, uh, with other uh, not, very, um, uh, not very good fiscal policies. So really, we should concentrate on what is really good. You know, about 70 or 60 years ago, some people thought that trade was bad because 
um, because uh, it was associated with a crisis. <coughs> now, after the financial crisis, cross-border financial services are considered to be bad, and that is, will prove to be very wrong as well. We're moving into second fragmented markets and because of this crisis, and I think that is wrong. I think for financial services, it's just like I think any other good, too, should be produced there where it is produced well and where the conditions are good uh, for it. And I believe, really, uh, stability and legal uh, certainty is certainly something that is extremely important for financial services. And that's, that's, that's what Switzerland and other, those centers that we talk about now can provide. Well, thank you. <clears throat> I, just, I think most of the technical arguments have been given by a gentleman on either side of me, most of which I concur with. And I think that by the time we finished here, people hopefully will not think of offshore centres as sunny places for shady people, as Nicholas would have us believe. <coughs> the, <coughs> but um, I'd like to pose a couple of uh, arguments for you to think about. There's been a lot of talk this afternoon about tax. There's been... Uh, a slightly the idea of morality and taxation has just started to come in. I'd just like to pose a, a little argument to you, and that is that um, with the tax differential arbitrage, whatever you want to call it, is an advantage which certainly offshore centres do use. But I'd like to ask you how that arose. It was never a case of the offshore centres dropping taxes to get an advantage. And what has happened, if you look at uh, certainly Western Europe, what has happened with successive uh, governments through fiscal mismanagement, they've got themselves into such a state that they have to have penal tax regimes in place. <coughs> and what this does th th at the moment, because they have to have these massively penal tax regimes to pay back the debts they've incurred, to keep paying pensions, um, to do all these things which they promised to the voters in order to get votes, they've got themselves into a massively bad situation. So then we have a differential between places such as the Crown Dependencies, which do not have debts, and then all of a sudden, we've got these same governments, uh, particularly um, from continental EU, saying, um, this is wrong, you're doing something wrong. You should actually be like us. You, know, you, you shouldn't have this advantage. It's not us that have caused this advantage, it's these other governments. And the same argument that they're using to get Starbucks to pay them money, they're now trying to reverse that argument and say that we're doing something wrong. <coughs> I'll just uh, leave that little argument with you to think about, and I think we're all ready to take questions from you now. Thank you. Panelists, you are wonderful people. Thank you very <laughs> much for that. I hope that there's some vibrant discussion to match your brevity. Uh, could I have some hands up for people? That, gentlemen, you wanted to make a comment earlier. Would you, you sure? Okay. Other hands up? Lady here. Thank you. Still um, sparkling. Sparkling. Mark Phil, following up on people not paying their taxes and having money invested. As I know, I repeat myself, many parts of the world today. Thanks. How, how effective are we? Well, I've come back because so many people have mentioned Starbucks. Uh, <laughs> I would just love to know if anybody can tell me to whom did Starbucks pay their voluntary tax and how did they manage to do it? Because as far as I'm concerned, from all my experience of being a chartered accountant, in the revenue take in money that is due to them. They do not take in money that is not due to them. <laughs> I wish I had your experience. <laughs> Anyways, some other hands? Oh, come on, there we go. Don't be shy, this is a... It's a closed, highly recorded session. I think if I could just go back to the point that was raised there, I don't think when it happened it was, but I do believe uh, that in the last budget that they changed the law so that now if taxation is in dispute, they can now take it directly from one's bank account and then argue about it afterwards. Is that correct? 
Um, well, there are, uh, for example, there's an article I'm writing for The Telegraph, I think it's going to be published tomorrow, I've written it about this whole issue actually with uh, the disputes over for the film financing, uh, which has been a major problem with, uh, where uh, film financiers have um, been very upfront and transparent about their, their tax affairs, and as I say, money has been taken, uh, and there's ongoing disputes for several years, where they've, they've paid tax upfront, which um, um, has been um, a matter of dispute, which they've not, not been able to get back. Uh, either. Um, uh, it goes to the more general, sorry, perhaps if we can be touch on it. It goes to the more general issue. I thought if I saw the head of uh, Starbucks UK a uh, matter of days um, after the whole Ferrari began, uh, and you know, after he had denounced that they were going to pay this voluntary £20 million sum, I think it was paid to HMRC, but on quite on, on what basis um, and what taxable basis, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure either. And it was a very depressing state of affairs, because I, I and I said to him as well, I listen, the one thing, you either make a case, which of course was the initial case that Starbucks and others have made, which was actually we are not making a profit because we are building up a huge number of Starbucks uh, um, chains and it's co that's costing a hell of a lot of money. But then essentially to be bullied, um, almost like Dane Geld, to, mm. to pay money across, I think we've set a very, very dangerous precedent. Um, I think we should have, um, uh, and it worries me about the, the, the political process and uh, as someone who's obviously involved in politics as well, but I was a businessman before I became an MP. But I think we're going through a very, very dangerous uh, situation at the moment where there is a, a media hue and cry. Um, and it applied to high-profile individuals um, who also had their tax affairs going uh, ac across the front page of, of the newspapers. But I think as far as companies were concerned, you need to have a, a process that is open uh, a process that, that makes it clear that a country is open for business. And I think we were going down a very, very dangerous path. And we're still going down that path to a large extent. And one of the things that uh, Jakob didn't say, of course, was that in relation to the Swiss banking fraternity, the, uh, it, it was alleged two years ago in the budget that somehow or at an autumn statement that, were, that there were £8 billion pounds of money um, that, that were going to be uh, uh, reclaimed. And indeed, that was already banked uh, by the Chancellor in uh, in the projections of, uh, of public spending um, over a period of time. It now looks as though it's going to be roughly one-tenth of that that will come through. Now, partly um, it's because open disclosure rules have meant that some individuals say, right, we'll, get, we'll, we'll now go down the route of open, open disclosure rather than uh, anything else. But I actually think there is a principle of privacy, of individual privacy. Um, and I know in the modern world <coughs> that uh, secret, secrecy and transparency uh, need to be intermingled to an extent. But I think, again, we've gone down a very dangerous path um, that individuals are not having a right of a private relationship um, yeah. of, with the, the tax authorities. But somehow it is now seen that uh, uh, every, all these things should be entirely open. And indeed, if you try and stand up for your privacy or secrecy, you are somehow uh, accused of, of nefarious uh, practice. Um, <clears throat> going back to the point earlier on, how, how strong has the enforcement been? I'm not naive about it, and um, I have to say as a, someone who uh, obviously will, broadly speaking, stand up for the banking fraternity and has done so since 2008, there aren't very many MPs who do, I, I'm increasingly worried by more and more scandals that are coming to the fore. There is a risk that uh, Almost any innovative product that has been marketed over the last 15 years is now seen as being subject almost to, to, a, to a mis-selling scandal. And, and indeed, the banks themselves uh, perhaps are less willing to stand up for their own, um, for, for their own situation. But you look at you know, whether it's um, PPI scandal, um, the whole issue with LIBOR, now the whole f uh, foreign exchange <laughs> situation. Um, th I'm afraid, it seems to me, we're a long way off um, being able to draw a line, and at various stages, the banking fraternity have, have asked uh, or demanded that a, a line gets, gets drawn. Um, and it's a dangerous state of affairs. It goes back to the fundamentals of what we've been discussing here. What is a, a, an effective and efficient banking system for, and the good it should be doing to the, the economy? And many, I suspect probably there have been enough debates in this very hall going back to the 1870s and 1880s. There were a lot of complaints then that the city wasn't working uh, for the, uh, and one, one looks at the uh, repeated scandals, particularly in the railway and mining industries that took place, um, that, that you know, the, bank, the banking system wasn't there to fund the capitalist system and to fund um, British industry. That, that, as I say, is a debate that's gone on for 130 or 140 years. But in the midst of all of these sort of ongoing scandals and the, and the inability, I think, of the banks to be able to draw an absolute line under what's happened in the past and for us to be able to move on, it's actually UK PLC that is suffering. You know, we are not having, we have now not got a, 
uh, a properly functioning banking system that is going to allow the, the correct investment um, going forward. No, I don't, I don't just blame that. I, 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 listen, I would go back, certainly the debt crisis, uh, a huge number of political decisions that were made, mm -hmm. and we were all living a long, lot beyond our means, and that you have to blame individuals for elements of that. And if you've read stuff I've been writing in the last couple of years, I'm extremely worried. We are still living miles beyond our means. Uh, we have these ultra-low interest rates, which will come at... There is a consequence that we're going to have from, essentially, we've had 63 consecutive months of 0.5% interest rates in this country. Um, that has essentially been a political decision to buy um, a, a, a level, I mean, a significant level, of social cohesion. Um, not, a, not a bad thing. And I, uh, There are parallels, I'm afraid, with what we've got today with what happened in the 1930s here uh, in the UK. In the 1930s, we did a similar thing. You know, we, uh, we essentially... Um, uh, decided to go for what was called empire free trade. Um, we moved away from, from, from global trade. We had uh, a lot of protectionism with the empire that we had at that stage. Uh, that brought us social cohesion and, of course, in great contrast to what was happening in much of main, mainland Europe at that time. There are similarities to what's happening today. <laughs> if you look at what's happening in Spain and Greece and Portugal, where there, the austerity is really causing major, major problems. The difficulty the British faced in the 1950s was that we, um, bit by bit, made our industry ever more uncompetitive and I worry that the unintended consequences of these very low interest rates are going to play themselves out over the next 10 to 15 years and the lack of competitiveness in the, in the UK economy going forward. Okay. Well, that's, um, that's, that's very depressing. Uh, two points, actually, I might say. Uh, one, for those of you who aren't aware, Mark published a book um, earlier uh, this year, was it? Yeah. It was last year, yeah. Last, last year, year, sorry. Um, uh, of his collected speeches, which um, I hasten to add, turned out to be somewhat prescient, so it, it is actually a, a good book. And on the succession of scandals being discussed in this hall, um, some of you may remember we had a similar symposium uh, last year in January called What the Dickens, where we were staunchly assured that there were no more scandals in, in, in the city. Uh, so, uh, so, so we'll leave it at that. Anyway, um, we've got a few more questions. Gentlemen there. Um, so, uh, IOCs have played a significant role in the experimental innovation in financial services products. Um, what are, can the architects and governors of IOCs do to stop any negative consequences of these experiments getting back into the domestic financial jurisdictions? Okay, thank you. So, on um, controlling innovation, actually, we're coming to you later. So, gentlemen there. Yes, I, I would like to explore, I think, a concept, a concept that Richard Hay made in his uh, discussion that governments are segmented, but the international financial system is, is unified. Uh, this means that tax systems are segmented and are attempting to address some irregularities that may occur in a unified uh, financial system. And I think the FATCA legislation from the U.S. Uh, I, uh, IRS is one way in which this is being addressed. But of course, it's illegal. How can you legally address this particular, how can you actually practically address, so we don't get into the theory concept, uh, how can you practically address this particular issue that since global flows are integrated, but tax areas are not. Thank you. Gentleman over there. Um, my name is Jason Piney. I'm a corporate partner with a law firm in Bermuda, Conny Still. Um, and obviously I'm delighted by the tone of today's presentation. I'm almost expecting to pick up my daily mail tomorrow and see front page IFC's save the day recovery is here. But I guess we're not quite there yet. Um, my, my serious point in question um, picks up on Richard Hayes' uh, presentation as well, is what, what can we, you know, but we know any other, other IFCs do to sort of continue, hopefully to continue, to improve uh, public perception? And, you know, um, I suppose as, as an add-on, you know, will, will the British government assist with that? Why don't we pause there? So IFC is an innovation. Uh, tax segmentation in a in a global economy, and uh, what can IFCs do? And uh, uh, in fact, Mark, you've had a bit of a go there. Uh, Jakob, do you yes. want to pick up on some of that? 
What IFC? Excuse me. What? I, I, I was trying to figure out which question was addressed well, to me. So. Any, any of the three you'd like, they okay. weren't addressed to you specifically. So any, any of the three that uh, you'd like to remark upon? Or not? Maybe not, not right now. Well, Stuart, well, you, head up of, a, you head up an IFC. So. One of, one of, I think one of the questions, if I understood it correctly, was uh, some concern about um, new products that are being introduced in IFCs and could they damage, do damage getting back? into, say, the, the UK or affecting what the so-called major economies. Um, I think before we go into, into detail on that, I think one of the things worth mentioning here is, that, is, is the issue of compliance and uh, being open and transparent. And to give you an idea, the OECD uh, recommended that there's something like 40 and 9, they call it, recommendations that all uh, countries should comply with an open, in order to be open and transparent. But let me tell you that Jersey is probably by far the most compliant. It ha I believe it complies with 44 of the 49, which is streets ahead of the UK or Switzerland and lots of, lots of other places. So I think the effect, the reason I mention that, because I think it will mitigate that fear in as much as that when uh, <coughs> new ideas are tried out, in offshore centres. Uh, they are being open and transparent. They're not trying to do anything behind a shut door. They're concerned about, they're extremely concerned about uh, their reputation. I mean, reputational damage is one of the worst things that can happen to a small area, as, as in Bermuda or as in the Crown Dependencies. Uh, so the, the, they also want to um, have stability so that the people who want to come and do business there can see that they're not changing things rapidly all the time. So I think a lot of the changes that they make will be not be revolutionary, they'll be uh, incremental or it'll be reiterations of something going backwards and forwards. Um, some of the ones that I'm aware of at the moment, um, for example, are <coughs> we're looking at bringing in something along the lines of an AML passport, so that if somebody has one of these they can deal with anybody in any jurisdiction in which it's recognised to cut down on wasted time and money within industry it's spent on AML compliance, which will actually improve AML compliance. So is that going to damage the UK if it comes back here? If one of the small IFCs leads with a superior AML standard, which is much higher, and that leaks back into one of the main countries, is that a bad thing for the, boat, for the big country? Or I don't think so. I think that the changes that are made there and are driven there and that people want, and that's why people come and do business there, I think by the very nature of private business, people in other jurisdictions will see that people want that and then they will adopt it. They're not going to adopt practices which people don't want or which are damaging. I think a more sensible route for IFCs in terms of innovation is to innovate in small sectors, um, mm -hmm. market sectors. For example, again, having been out uh, to China, the Isle of Man, they're very proud of the work they do in, in ship and aircraft finance, in, in yachting, mm -hmm. uh, in yacht, yacht, yacht registration, uh, in the space industry. These are all seem to be good areas of, uh, small areas of innovation where mm -hmm. the, these big indus the industries haven't taken off massively in, in <coughs> bigger centres, but um, they can be uh, quite a, an interesting place that, that uh, registration and, and work can be done from international financial centres. The main danger, I think, and if, if I were advising an IFC, I, I, I'm afraid my words are far less silky than, uh, than we heard from Richard earlier on. Richard made a very good case, I think, for uh, why people use our international financial centres, which are not a, a nefarious, just about getting rid of tax. It's actually the, the sense of stability, um, the sense of the rule of law, mm -hmm. you know, particularly within uh, British uh, jurisdictions. <clears throat> I think the, the thing really is to do that well, um, and actually to get involved in innovative products, to be seen as any, in any way a Wild West show, particularly when you're, mm. you're going to be seeing the changes that will happen uh, uh, with all of the ring fencing um, of, uh, of banks going forward. The last thing IFCs want to be is to be regarded as outside a ring fence and be, to be there for a lot of innovative products being created. One of the difficulties we're facing, again, being candid with all of you, with our banking system, I'm afraid to say, um, too much of banking is just not going to be very profitable going forward. 
the regulation, the amount of capital that banks are going to have to retain will make banking ever less profitable. And I'm afraid it will be ever more of an incentive to go down the route for more innovative products to try and raise more profit. Uh, and one of the difficulties is that, uh, from the IFC's point of view, the last thing they want to be involved in, I think, is uh, in that side of, uh, of, of the banking uh, business. Um, I have to say, um, uh, I'm sure there are some sunny places for shady, shady people, people, particularly in Bermuda. Um, certainly, if you've been to the Isle of Man, or Alderney for that matter, in uh, February or March, there's not much sun. Not much in April, May or June, I think, actually, for quite a lot of the time, to be really honest. Um, so that I, that I wouldn't advise it uh, all, all the time. But, uh, uh, but that, 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 I think, is the, the, the fundamental of where I think IFCs have to be. There's always going to be a blame game. Um, but I think that, as I say, what's happened with Jersey, what's happened with the Isle of Man being ahead of the game on FATCA, um, actually um, being ahead of the game on money laundering regulations, um, on, on a, a lot of the financial uh, wherewithal. I mean, it's, it's, it is a fact, as uh, mm. Stuart's pointed out, Jersey um, actually ticks the box more than most EU members in terms of um, complying as quickly as possible to a lot of uh, EU banking uh, regulation that's come through. Now, inevitably, uh, one of the difficulties of that is it, uh, it potentially affects the profitability of international financial centres. But I think uh, if, if those centres who want to be ahead of the game and want to remain um, d desirable and remain out of the claws of populist politicians, they're going to have to go down that route. Yeah. I'm actually a bit worried, talking about financial innovation, I'm actually a bit worried that we will not have enough of it anymore yeah. because uh, we are so worried that some of it may be dangerous. Now, we, of course, we have, we have big reasons to be worried after the 2008 crisis, but we shouldn't prepare for the last crisis. We should prepare for the next one. And with the regulation that had been, regulation is being really beefed up a lot. And I, I think the principle should be that someone needs to be able to, to decide on what he does, with that, how, he, how, he, how, he, how he makes his investment or her investment. So it depends. It's a question of, of suitability. Mm -hmm. But the direction we're going, uh, especially in continental Europe, uh, is, is, uh, is that basically investor, the investor is taken for an idiot. And, 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 and in the end, uh, the investor doesn't have a choice anymore. He can only invest plain vanilla, plain vanilla in such a way that there will not be any return anymore. So we need to be a little bit careful there. We also need to be uh, careful that the regulation is also really effective. A lot of it is not very effective. It's just putting a lot of, a lot of red tape around the place. So if we're worried about whether innovation is, 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 is safe, I'm probably more worried that there's not going to be enough of it anymore because we only worry about safety, not also, uh, we're not worried about the preferences and the abilities and, uh, and the responsibility of the investor for what she or he is doing. If I could, um, yeah, well, uh, Jakob, you may not be aware locally, there's a, a very interesting discussion that uh, uh, gambling is almost completely unregulated and I can totally lose my shirt and if I make a lot of money, I pay no tax. Um, on the other hand, I can't invest in a financial product <laughs> without uh, heaps of cost and, and protection. And then when I do make a profit, it's tax. So uh, it's almost the... And then we say that people don't save enough. So, uh, you know, strange that. I think there was one question that wasn't covered there, but wasn't answered, Michael. Somebody asked what can uh, IFOs do to improve their reputation? What can they uh, do to let people know they're better places to do business? And my answer to that would be a lot. It's something... They're caught a little bit on the back foot. Um, they're always, <coughs> there's always an implication, and you've seen it here today, not only an implication that there's something not quite right with them, we've got people who vehemently believe that. Um, so it's, it's very difficult, particularly when uh, the journalists and the papers want nice, juicy headlines. You know, 800 people who've, com who've got a criminal record have suddenly got a bank account in in one of, the offshore, one of the offshore banks. And when you look through it, okay, there's some very nasty people around who hurt dogs and all the rest of it. They're not exactly multinational uh, crooks. It, it, it's very easy for the press to make a case, and it's very politically expedient. We live in a time of the politics of envy. You know, people love it. You know, let's make up this uh, ogre that sort of has got five million quid locked away, he's not paying tax on and go after him. So I think they could do an awful lot more um, to let people know what they really do. 
Um, I think transparency is, is something that, that should be there. I think it's in everybody's interest uh, that that happens, but I think we could do an awful lot more. And I think most of the uh, international centres tend to be a bit on the back foot. They haven't really got their act together as fully as they could do with uh, putting forward a positive image. Um, one other question that we really didn't address was on tax segmentation, and I, 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 I like to come back at this in a slightly different fashion, because I'd also like to look a bit further forward. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the monetary nature of the crisis, so uh, you know, future pensions, abuse of the tax system by governments, uh, length of GDP. Uh, Nicholas uh, referred to the currency wars, which you know, again arose in the same 1930s period we keep contrasting things with. Um, and the reason I'm reminding of all of that is, of course, also in the 1930s, people began issuing large amounts of their own currencies uh, because uh, the tax system is the monetary system. We are trading tax credits. That's what we do in these fiat currencies. It's a, it's a very tightly coupled nature. Um, now, at the moment, there are uh, about 50 alternative coins out there, not just bitcoins. So there's about 50 other ones. Stuart, I know you have a few plans about this, but uh, do we see looking ahead that the IFCs might be either facilitating these things or moving off them completely or, or are we going to see a complete decoupling of governments abusing their tax and monetary systems uh, while international trade soars off and develops its own methods of dealing with it? So maybe a slightly more uh, adventurous question. Sorry. Okay. Rules are good. So, panelists, maybe you could respond to that. Would that help? Um, to to the, the introduction or to the fact that rules and regulations that we like. Well, it all goes together because I think rules are what we subscribe to and we agree to do that. But regulations, what the damn federal government does for us, you know? but in fact, yeah. they have the same in a way because they can prescribe I, our actions, but. Again, we, this moves us into self-regulatory business as opposed to government regulation. I, I think that rules. It, it is sort of a, really. I think the rules are something which allow everybody who's in the game to know what's going on, and regulation is somebody imposing what they want on on top of you. It's putting a, a different uh, ma matrix over over the top. Um, so I think. It's, it's very interesting, isn't it? If one thinks um, what, uh, take taxation, we're talking a lot about that now, and, and penal taxation. Now, why do governments have to introduce penal taxation? Because, they f because of fiscal mismanagement. Um, it, and in fact, if people in the private sector um, did what is being done in government, they'd be locked up. When Bertie Madoff, do Madoff does it, he gets 30 years. When uh, the treasurer of a country does it, uh, as in taking in money for the tax system, he, everybody thinks it's wonderful. Um, so it's how do you turn the, the, the regulation um, round? So, it, it, you know, as I say, regulation is almost something, another matrix on top of the rules, which is the way somebody wants the rules interpreted. And that, is that always good for business? I don't, I don't think so. Well, I mean, uh, to, to go slightly off, off piece on that, I mean, you're right. I mean, the, the whole public pension system is a massive Ponzi scheme at the moment, yeah. um, uh, to be brutally honest. And um, uh, you know, the, the worry anyone has about, I mean, I, you know, I am worried about where we're going in the, in the medium to long term. I mean, I, I have confidence in my own country to think, you know, we, we are a country of innovators, um, but we're also a very globalised community. And uh, my worry is that actually the message, particularly to uh, some of our brightest and best young graduates today is, well, the reward for being British is that you're going to be paying huge amounts of money, uh, essentially, in your tax, which is uh, the deferred benefits that your parents and grandparents have, uh, have racked up. You're not going to be able to benefit to, to anything like the same extent. And the truth, of course, is our brightest and best graduates have got a huge number of options. And I, I left university um, 25, 26 years ago. And, um, you know, it didn't occur to me to do anything other than stay here. And I briefly trained as a lawyer, and then I was a businessman before going into parliamentary life. But I know that many of my young graduates uh, um, in, in Imperial College and King's College and at London School of Economics in my constituency today, uh, I mean, it's fa fa fantastic to see just how 
focused they are about going abroad. I mean, not mm -hmm. least because a significant number of their young undergraduate and, and postgraduate colleagues, of course, are from uh, overseas. But they all say, listen, going to spend some time in the United States or in China or in Hong Kong, Singapore, mm -hmm. India uh, to go and work. And many will go and live and perhaps stay out there on a longer term basis. And there are some fundamental problems. We are living miles beyond our means. And <clears throat> there is a sense of pensions being a Ponzi scheme um, going, going, going forward. And um, there aren't going to be easy solutions to it. And uh, at one level, it's easy to blame politicians. But equally, the politicians are being elected. And, and um, I mean, the, one of the criticisms I had of my own party before the last election, but I could understand it, when the moment that we did start telling it as it was uh, about mm -hmm. austerity, um, uh, about six months before the general election, suddenly the polls narrowed and no one wanted to hear that message. And I'm afraid, I personally think that in British politics we are probably in a very similar situation to the 1970s. Mm. Um, and at the beginning of uh, this decade, um, as, as in the beginning of the 1970s, there was a sense that things weren't right, but equally there wasn't quite this, the sense of urgency that, that needed to be solved. And I, I'm... I'm 50 this year, so I, I well remember in 1979, um, I know many conservatives in this country wistfully talk about the Margaret Thatcher time, but it was a sense of a real crossroads. We had gone through a decade of real pain, and suddenly someone was telling us it was, and we thought, right, we're going to have to go with this. We know it's going to be a white knuckle ride, and we'll have to go ahead. And if there's a parallel, and I hope it's not a parallel for my own party's sake, but I think we may well be in 1973-74 in, in equivalent terms, that probably we'll need another dose of socialism to actually let the country come to its senses with a, a radical programme for the 2020 election. Now, I hope it won't come to that, but that's being candid with you, almost Chatham House rules, I suppose, that, that's where I, I fear we, we, we may well be at. Um, because I think, you know, there are some big problems there, and in many ways, these very low interest rates have masked the problem. We are still living so far beyond our means. And the truth of the matter is, although for all the talk of austerity, we will borrow more. Mr. Osborne's administration, as Treasurer, as Chancellor Exchequer, he is borrowing more in this, this term of Parliament than has ever been borrowed in any uh, term of Parliament before. Uh, and that's with all the talk of austerity. And, and you know, it, it's going to be very, very difficult to get public spending down. And I, I look at these sort of... You know, to get it down um, to, and be able to do so with, with uh, 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 sort of political consent from the public at large. And, you know, we are now kind of spending around about £700 billion a year, and we're only able to raise around about £600 billion a year from taxes. And that, mm. that's after a whole lot of uh, measures to try and reduce public spending have come into play. Something is going to have to give, and when interest rates begin to rise, um, you know, it will be... Very, very problematic, I think. Um, and th that's the sort of thing that we're going to be facing. Uh, and part of the difficulty, and it's one of my, my other themes I've come up with a, a lot, is that there is a sense, it goes back to this issue of envy politics, and I worry about this, that you have a, a sense of a global super rich who, and I see it in my own constituency, who really, this, it doesn't really affect them. You know, it kind of doesn't matter one, one way or another. But increasingly, there's a sense of unease, not just from the usual suspects on the left of politics, but from a lot of middle-class Tory voting people who think, actually, the rules of capitalism are now heavily skewed against us. And uh, it is very, very dangerous, I think, that, that situation, because um, and you want to see it in other parts of the world, you know, look at from the 1930s onwards in something like Argentina, where middle-class people, middle-class, essentially establishment people who think they've done the right thing, worked hard, uh, then feel themselves the losers under, under the system as it begins to develop. And that, I think, is, a, you know, that is the, the, the problem that, that we face uh, to a large extent. And you know, I'm, not, I'm, not really very, I'm not critical, really, of what's happened in the last three or four years. I, I'm not sure that, had I been Chancellor of the Exchequer, I, I, you could do very much else. But the truth is, um, we've parked too many of our problems. I mean, really hardly begun the long, long road to solving them. But the previous chancellors could have done an awful lot. Oh, yeah. no, I, no, I, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 I warned you today <laughs> that we would... Uh... But I, I think that Mark's comments do just go reinforce what I was saying earlier about this differential in the tax systems. And you listen to someone there coming from the heart of Westminster and the city is saying that the over, the, his own government is over-borrowing that is, and it's not just here. Look at France. Oh, yeah. Look at yeah. look at yeah. everywhere yeah. else. It's, it's everywhere, massively yeah. bad. So this differential between offshore centres and the big, if you like, controlling countries is, is just going to get wider. And 
I think whether you like it or not, the, you know, the, the fact incentives do count. And you quoted Bush as saying he thinks nothing of incentives. I think they never work. And then you yeah. quote, and then you quoted Buffett uh, just after. Well, I'll give you another quote from Buffett, which he came out with about a week ago. He said, "The only mistake I've made in my career." is not believing strongly enough in incentives. He said, because they work. And he said, the older I get, the more wrong I realize I have got that. And those two statements of his are entirely compatible with mm. each other. Okay. All right, we've got just a few more, to, time for only a few more comments, and I'd like to bring um, some new people in. So Chiara, and then the gentleman back there. Any other hands up other than? All right, these are the last three then. I work with Michael at the end. Uh, for full disclosure, I'm actually based in Switzerland and I'm a Swiss citizen. Um, we've heard a lot, and I think Richard, you did a great job at that, at uh, showing the added value somehow, uh, or at least the incentive for using offshore centers for financial intermediation between investors in Western countries and investees in emerging markets. We haven't, however, heard that much about financial intermediation between offshore centers. My personal example of that is when I went for an extended weekend in Guernsey, and I had the pleasure of seeing at the airport when landing a lot of Swiss private banks being, you know, having representation there. So I wonder whether Stuart and Jacob in particular would like to comment on that. Okay. The second thing, I think offshore centers have are often perceived to be competitors, competing to attract business and transactions. And I would think that given the, the external pressure that they're facing, the, the intensive scrutiny and, uh, um, well, the intensive public scrutiny and criticism, uh, that there is an incentive for them to actually work together. And so again, to Jacob and Stuart, is that becoming a reality? Are you working on common issues together? Thank you, Kara. Gentleman at the back, Chloe. What was the first part of that question? Was it, you had your hand up earlier. Did you not want to? Yes. No, okay, over, the, over to the, the lady here. So, yeah. any ideas just how severe the future cuts are going to be? And uh, coming to Guernsey, it's rarely acknowledged as being a tax haven, but how is the future problems concerning Arch Crew going to affect its reputation? Yeah. Okay. Panelists, um, we're going to use the next uh, five, six minutes to, to close, so if you could address the questions, and then if you'd like to add a closing statement, that would probably also help. Um, and Stuart, could I start with you, please? Yeah, surely. Um, I think the lady over there was talking about competition between uh, the IFOs. Um, I think um, anybody who is in, uh, I was going to say a similar line of business, but that's not quite the right way to put it. Anybody who is doing, it, it finds themselves in a similar situation, <coughs> Is going to be there's going to be a certain amount of commonality, but if you look very carefully at uh, most of the big offshore uh, centres, we've talked about the Caymans earlier on, you find they specialise very, very. Uh, each area will specialise very strongly in a particular area. You've got areas, for example, are very strong in insurance. Uh, Guernsey is very strong on reinsurance. You've got some places that are very that specialise in shipping finance. Some places that in aircraft finance. So there will be a degree of commonality, but I think as these niche markets grow, uh, it's a bit like a snowball. As they, as they get good at something or they find their niche area, they pick up more and more of that business. Um, so there's a, there's a certain amount of overlap, but I don't think in many cases that there will be competition, but I don't think they're sort of going head to head with one another and going to wipe one another out or anything like that. Um, to go to, I think, the, the next part of the thing was, uh, that's the competition. Um, you were talking about them working together. The first part of your question, I think, was in intermediation and working together. I think that, um, for example, in, in small areas, I think you'll find, for example, the Crown Dependencies uh, will work uh, very closely with the government, and they work to a degree closely, to, closely together. Um, they want to make, if for no other reason than 
the other two don't want the other one to get too far ahead. So they'll sort of, they, they, will, <laughs> they will work together to a degree. Um, I think you're not going to find the Crown dependencies working closely um, with the overseas dependencies, uh, as they call themselves, because they're that much removed. And if you think they're not going to work closely together, they're going to work even less closely with, say, Hong Kong, Dubai or Singapore. So I think, again, within pockets or areas, there'll be a little bit, but I don't think you're ever going to see all the offshore centres, uh, a union of offshore centres. That's never going to happen. Uh, the title of, of this panel is How Fair is Fair Offshore. Could I just ask you, um, in your opinion, particularly you know, uh, being a president of one, <laughs> um, you know, how would you rate things today and where do you see them in the future? Just um, well, I, I, just before I go on, there was a lady asked a question about Guernsey. Um, you're not going to like the answer. I can't answer that because I'm not from Guernsey. You'd have to ask somebody from Guernsey how they're going to get on there. Um, oh, that's a different question. Um, <laughs> Uh, um, however, how are, um, where are we today, where are we going to be in the future? Um, I think um, we are suffering to a degree, as all financial centres are, as a result of 2008. I think that um, that's had a profound effect on the way everybody does business and everybody is trying to find the way out. And I think it's, it'll be more a case of evolution than some panacea that some, somebody comes up with. So I think that the, I think this offshore centres will continue to be there. I think they will continue to grow and I think they'll continue to evolve. And I think as, um, <coughs> as, as international trade continues to grow, there will be, there will be new reasons for international offshore centres to be there, as well as the ones we've all been talking about today. I think um, one of the, the questions that are of concern, um, I'm certainly in the Western world, and possibly less so the further east you go, but one has to ask yourself is that will offshore centres in the Western Hemisphere, which offer financial services to external clients, will they exist only in the future with the consent of major blocks or big powers that, that they could always, there's always a possibility they could bring pressure to bear and, and close them down. I, I don't think they will, but I think that is a, a question that has to be asked. I think the degree of oversight will dictate the scope and scale and range of services offered by offshore centres to agree, to a degree. And I also think that offshore centres in Asia, Pacific, and South America, they won't be subject to the same pressures to conform. So you could well see, as you've seen the rise of Hong Kong, we're seeing, we've seen the rise of Singapore, we've seen what Dubai is trying to do, there's places in uh, South America, uh, and I think they will be far more, if you like, footloose and fancy free. They'll be, to use a John Wayne expression, they'll be more likely to shoot from the hip. Um, than the more established offshore centres. So I think that's probably the way they're going. If Thank you, sir. Jakob, would you? Um, I'll address the, the question of that I, thought, I think was addressed to me, uh, intermediation between, between the financial centres. You've seen Swiss banks uh, <laughs> in Niles. You will see them in many places in the world because Swiss banks, Swiss, Swiss bank is a truly global enterprise and I think that is actually what uh, the city of London has in common with Switzerland. You produce where you produce wherever um, uh, the environment, business environment, uh, uh, circumstances are best to produce what you're producing. So um, managing private wealth is done in Switzerland. Uh, 30, uh, 20, 26 percent of offshore offshore um, of offshore wealth is, is managed managed in Switzerland. Other things are being done elsewhere on the Cayman Islands and. For example, or in Luxembourg, uh, I'm, I'm mentioning those two two centres because uh, Luxembourg has a very important fund industry, and of course uh, the Swiss banks, uh, the Swiss, the Swiss in Switzerland, they will use those funds from Luxembourg. They will use Cayman products, uh, Cayman Island products, BVI products uh, for 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 other purposes, for asset management purposes. So there's certainly we're, 
the centers aren't just competing, of course. They're competing with the environment that they are offering for their particular particular products that, uh, that, that, that where the environment is best. And that's what you said before. It depends what you're producing. They're not producing the same things. The environment is not best for everything in one of those centers. So uh, the second question was whether we should uh, work a bit more together. Well, uh, I, I think so. That's why I'm here in London so often. <laughs> uh, I do think that we have a lot of common interests. Uh, because we produce globally, because, uh, uh, because the banking sector, the financial sector here, the financial sector in Switzerland, and, and in those centers that, are, uh, that we're talking about here, uh, uh, because they, they have, they, the, 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 the services are produced there because there is a comparative advantage. It is better done there than elsewhere, and elsewhere you do other things that are better done uh, there. It's just one of the things, uh, one of the goods that needs to be produced there, uh, where it's best produced. Um, how fair will offshore centers fare? Uh, fare? Well, I believe there will, they will always, always be necessary in that sense, uh, in the sense that you should do things where you can do them best. And financial services is no, exa no, uh, no exemption to that rule. Um, trade is good for something. Uh, we heard that in the opening, in the opening uh, presentation. Trade, uh, trade is, is, is to the benefit of everyone one who is trading. So I think those financial services will fare well. They will probably be different. They will, it will be more difficult for them because we have a trend towards uh, fragmentation of financial markets driven by larger, uh, larger and more powerful players. And that not to the benefit of, of, of the investor, not to the benefit of the consumer. But still, I think in the end, after a while, uh, we will see those uh, the advantages. Again, I just hope we won't take too long. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Can I thank Stuart and, and uh, Jakob for being such good, good co-panelists? It's actually also quite nice to have when panelists say different things rather than necessarily covering all this the same sort of ground. To answer the qu two questions directly, I don't think Arch Crew is going to be a major problem for Guernsey. I'm afraid probably it, it must be terrible if you're an investor with it but, or invested in, in it, but there are so many other scandals, I'm afraid, around at the moment. To answer also your question directly about public spending, um, I personally think before long, a government of whatever colour is going to have to take a different view on, on what the state does. There will be whole silos of public spending that will have to, have to go, as opposed to uh, this sort of uh, constant um, salami cuts. Um, there, will, there will be just whole areas that, where, the, where there will have to be a, a very candid conversation with, with the public at large about what the state does uh, in not just this country, but throughout the Western world. I've been trying to encapsulate a view um, to, to the gentleman, the American gentleman over here, because he's made, a, and I know we've probably not really properly answered um, many of his questions. Um, I have a sense that, and it applies as to why I'm more confident about the survival of offshore financial centres. I have a broad sense that eco the pace of economic globalisation, such as we've understood it over the past 20 or 25 years, is now in retreat. Um, um, and if that's the case, then I suspect um, the notion of a standardization which, uh, of regulation and of everything else that probably would come with fully-fledged total global uh, globalization going forward um, will, will not be the case. And as, if you don't have the standardization, there will be a place for, for, for these sorts of financial centers. Michael threw out that maybe this is something that the, uh, uh, the international financial Centers, the IFCs. Okay. They are the ones that are mm -hmm. and you. Have the, you have the level of discussion here where you don't have it between the leaders of the, all the segmented nations. And you could play it. I think it's very positive. Yeah. Uh, and so my instinct is that UK's offshore financial centres uh, do help to make the UK a uniquely attractive place in which to invest and give that variety for, for doing business. Uh, and I think investing in via such centres does minimise the risk of double taxation, provides, as we've heard, for the highest standard of market regulation, but enables access, very important access, to the English legal system and does guarantee a high degree of political certainty, which is one of the reasons that I think too much fiddling and tampering with the tax system 
um, plays away from this idea of political certainty and the notion of any political risk being attached to the UK or other countries has a danger as far as this sector is concerned. Because I personally think, Michael, in concluding, my concluding words, having such a strong link between um, this range of international financial centres and the UK is hugely beneficial, both to the City of London, something close to my own heart, but also, I think, more importantly, to the wider UK economy. Well, um, you know, we, we don't have a Chatham House rule. We have a Barnard's Inn regulation. <laughs> uh, and the Barnard's Inn regulation is to talk all about it, so there we go. Um, I think that's been an excellent panel, and I'd like you to join me in thanking them for getting up there and telling us what they think. <laughs>now just before we close chloe have you, have you is, uh, is good, exactly that's, that's what I'm james have you got the, yeah thank you um, just before we close there you are you're, you're way ahead of us chloe thank you um, i was going to give uh, both nicholas and richard 90 seconds just to just to come back so nicholas first perhaps I'm sorry, but I think 90 seconds is not sufficient because there's, but it's a, lot the time we have. Been, there's a lot of stuff here that has been said that is, that is frankly wrong and needs serious challenge. Um, the Starbucks, uh, just for example, um, the arguments that have been put forward here are that uh, you just pay taxes according to the, to, the, to the law and that's the end of the story. Absolutely not. The street protesters are quite right about this. There is a huge disjuncture between the economic aspects of what's happening in here and the technical legal aspects of what's going here. Starbucks is reporting large economic profits in the UK, but it is recording very small taxable profits in the mm -hmm. UK. There is a huge problem here. Um, uh, Starbucks is, like many other corporations, free riding off the services paid for by others. They are receiving subsidies from British taxpayers to make their economic profits. Um, uh, the international tax system is broken. Um, but that doesn't mean that we should only hold governments to account. Corporations play a big part in writing, helping write the tax laws of this country under these very accommodating governments of Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, uh, David Cameron. Um, and this is, they need to have their feet held to their fire, and it's quite right, the protesters are quite right, and the tax profession, uh, or sections of the tax profession that have come out and said they're wrong, they are wrong, I'm afraid. Um, there is an alternative system, and this goes to Richard's um, very well-argued point about the role of offshore financial centres as um, uh, conduits, as tax-neutral platforms for international uh, trade. This role is a role that can... It is a, probably the strongest argument that could be made in defence of offshore financial centres, in, in my view, along with the stability argument, which I'd like to have time to discuss. Um, but it's not the only way of doing it. Offshore financial centres are not the only way of doing this. If we look at a tax system, if we're looking at tax, there is a radical alternative which is already implemented in, among some US states and in various other places uh, where you move away from the current broken international tax system towards a system of what is known as unitary taxation. Where you tax corporations, you don't consider them as loose collections of separate entities trading with each other at supposedly at arm's length and then walk through the thickets of... Nicholas, we, we're going to have to... Okay, well, thank you. It's, it's a good okay. point. There are many good points, but there's also drinks. ...economic substance of what they do and where they do yeah. it. Gotcha. Um, and that would uh, cut out a lot of the business of offshore financial centres. I have many other points. I can. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, Michael, thank you very much for uh, hosting this and your lucid sure. remarks at the outset. Uh, it's been a delight to participate with everyone, and thank you to the audience for uh, all of the input. I think we can all see that financial services are a crucial support for global prosperity and uh, national interest, certainly in the United Kingdom. Mark's made the point, I certainly agree with it, that the relationship between the United Kingdom and its offshore centers has conferred considerable benefit, not only on the offshore centers, on the United Kingdom, and I believe the world at large, to have access to that stable legal system. In terms of the contribution of the offshore centers to uh, Britain, uh, Mark referred to work, I think a few people have, done by Capital Economics. I brought a few copies of the report to quantify the value of uh, Jersey in particular to Britain. 
Um, and I, I do hope that uh, amongst all the financial centers, they take seriously the job of educating a skeptical public on the important value they add. Thank you. Thank you, Richard.